You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Linsenmeyer. My guest for episode 171 is Ben Vaughn. He started releasing music as the Ben Vaughn Combo. He started making music in the late 70s, early 80s. You're right now hearing his 1985 Ben Vaughn Combo single, My First Band. He's since released maybe 23 albums. He's done TV soundtrack work for That 70s Show, Third Rock from the Sun, etc. He's been a producer for acts like Ween and the Swingers soundtrack, and he has a syndicated radio show. Today we're going to discuss Wayne Fontana Was Wrong from his 2022 album The World of Ben Vaughn, then I'm Sorry But So Is Brenda Lee. We'll talk about the 2007 version from Vaughn Sings Vaughn Volume 1, then look back to Too Sensitive for This World from his 1990 album Dressed in Black, as well as a special bonus, a song called Candyman from the 1996 album Cubist Blues, credited to Alan Vega, Alex Chilton, and Ben Vaughn. Finally, we'll conclude by listening to his 2022 single, Dancing In My Mind. For more, see benvon.org. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. And if you want to support the show, which will give you access to my episode notes, including lyrics, song structures, arrangement notes, you can do that at patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. Let's get to it. So I will play a little bit of my first band from the Ben Vaughn Combo, a 1985 single, to orient folks to talk about the beginning of your career. And I like the fact that that is so purposefully rudimentary, you know, that it's referring to the 60s garage rock, quoting it and describing it. And we're going to get that with our first song brand new. Wayne Fontana was wrong from the world of Ben Vaughn. Can we say a little bit? about the journey in between there. I know you did a couple of albums with your full band, went solo in 88, have released many albums since then, have done TV and things. Where are you at with the world of Ben Vaughn 2022? Well, it's interesting. I didn't even think about it until now, but if you play my first band and Wayne Fontana was wrong, it sounds like I, I haven't evolved at all over the last <laughs> 40 years. <laughs> I'm still in the same place, uh, referring to 60s AM radio. That was my first love. I'm at that age where I guess I was eight or nine years old when the Beatles hit and the Stones and the Kinks and the Who and all that. And I went crazy. My grades immediately went down and I wanted to be a musician or a DJ or a songwriter or something in rock and roll. I had the bug and I've explored a lot of different types of music in between, but that's kind of the basis of my, Mm -hmm. I guess my curiosity or my excitement about music is, is definitely rudimentary rock and roll. If you can't make it work stylistically, then what do you have? You know, <laughs> I mean, you, you have songs, I guess, with many chords and complicated lyrics and things, but you very often can just do a straight blues and sell it on the style. And your sort of purposefully low key, very unique style makes this work. But I guess say a little about this particular song, Wayne Fontana was wrong before we hear it. Well, it's an interesting thing. You know, as a songwriter, your antenna is always up. And so things come into your world or into your brain and suggest a song. And I was in Whole Foods and Game of Love by Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders came on the speakers. And halfway through it, I started thinking, he's wrong. Love is not a game. I have learned this in life. Love is definitely not a game. Wayne Fontana was wrong. And I was like, oh my God, that's a great title. There are three W's in it. You know, Wayne Fontana (laughs) was wrong. It it, it had everything. And, And it it sounded rhythmic right away, and I could hear the music instantly. And by the time I got home in my car, the whole song was written. I think it took five minutes total to write that. Wayne Fontana was wrong. Wayne Fontana was wrong. Love ain't a game. You can play all day long. was wrong when you look her in the eye don't be shy you don't need no secret sign just say what's on your mind and if you do true love will come to you that's why I'm telling you that Wayne Fontana was wrong Fontana was wrong, so wrong. Love ain't a game you can play all day long. Even though I love his song, Wayne Fontana. 
Montana was wrong. to hide the love you feel inside just wear it on your sleeve so she can see it and believe if you lay it on the line she'll be yours in time I know I'm repeating myself but Wayne Fontana was wrong he was wrong Wayne Fontana was wrong so wrong Love ain't a game You can play all day long No Even though I love his song Wayne Fontana was wrong He 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 was wrong So 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 some definite 60s quotations. You're not actually quoting that song. That doesn't have the Wayne Fontana song. Do you even think in terms of like that intro guitar riff? Like it's got to be lifted directly from something, but I'm not exactly sure what. Do you know? I have no idea. Maybe Hand Jive by um, Johnny Otis, maybe? Willie and the Hand Jive. It's that kind of lick. It's in a million songs. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about how you're putting this instrumental bed together? It doesn't sound like you're, it's not a full drum kit, right? It's maracas and something else. <laughs> Yeah, it's a snare drum, maracas, and hand claps. I was thinking of Eddie Cochran, actually, because if you listen to Summertime Blues and things like that, I think somebody's playing a suitcase on Summertime Blues with their hands. Uh -huh. And there's like, uh, I guess there's maracas. You can't tell because they put a lot of echo and everything in, on it. But I was thinking of Eddie Cochran, how those records don't have a real drum kit, some of those, and it doesn't matter because the in intention is so obvious. And what about your choice of organ sound there? Is that a purposefully, it sounds clearer than a 60s thing, but that could just be the recording. Is it, is it vintage equipment or is it a patch? No, it's a little thing I bought, um, a Yamaha Reface. This is not a product placement, by the way. It's a, a Yamaha Reface and it's a very tiny organ that has enough organ sounds and it has draw bars and everything. And a friend of mine, Marco Benevento, a really, really great keyboard player and songwriter. He lives up in Woodstock. I was visiting him and he had a, a reface and we were messing around with it. So I ordered one and it, it arrived in the middle of uh, lockdown. I recorded this album during lockdown. I'm one of probably 10 million artists who made a, a lockdown album. <laughs> well, you, you're already a one-man band. So I know there are plenty of artists who just, oh, I, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't get the band together, but you don't have that issue. So No, I've done several one-man band records and my Actually, the beginning of, of my experimenting with recording back when I was a teenager, I was really in love with that first McCartney album and Emmett Rhodes, that Emmett Rhodes album, where they played all the instruments themselves. And, and Dave Edmonds, too. I hear you knocking. That's him playing everything. I found out that information when I was a teenager. So when I first started recording, I immediately went into one-man band territory and figured, I, had, I have to figure out how to play bass. I have to figure out how to play all these things because this is apparently what you do. So... Recording this was, you know, when lockdown happened, I was getting ready to go into a studio and record these songs with a band, but that couldn't happen. So I just started cranking it out at home. I guess the issue with the one-man band thing, which is something I've also done since high school a little bit, but I'm still just now trying to feel like I'm I've reaching the point on drums where I'm sound like a talented high school drummer at the age of 50. So it's a, it's a long journey if you're at least trying to do more than really rudimentary stuff in every instrument. Yeah, I started out as a drummer, so I'm lucky. You know, when I was 12, I was playing drums in uh, high school garage bands and playing at high school dances and everything. So I started out as a drummer. So picking up other instruments was easy for me because I already had rhythm. You know, I could swing the beat convincingly and get people dancing. Like I, that was already happening for me. So 
picking up other instruments. If you're learning drums later, that's hard from what I hear. But, you know, I started out as a drummer, so it's very easy. Any other sorts of thoughts on, I, obviously, <laughs> given the speed that this was written, there's not going to be a lot of thought into the structure or anything. But I don't know, there's something, I can see how you, you say you wrote this in the car, that it's very linear in that you can sing everything that's supposed to stick out. The fact that it's, you know, then with the organ answering the guitar. So like you can sing both of those it's supposed to be more that catches the, is that part of your arranging style is like trying to avoid anything that will hidden depths that will trip you up. I know you do have a lot of textures on songs. So I'm not trying to, it's not a critical thing, but what is your thought on how simple to be in these arrangements? It's really funny. Avoiding hidden text or, or, <laughs> or textual stuff. It's funny because I'm not even approaching that much less avoiding it. It's like it doesn't come into my mind. I'm a very simple man, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Songwriting for me and arranging is something that's not really an intellectual pursuit. It happens. I know that's kind of a cliche to say that, you know, you're a conduit, you're an antenna, and the ideas come to you. But I really, a lot of times, don't remember the process of writing or recording. Like when it's over, I listen and go, oh, wow. It's like a malaria fever dream or something. <laughs> You know, you've got a bunch of complete stops, right? True love will come to you, stop. But it doesn't stop all the time. Like, you know, the line before that, if you do, the percussion keeps going at least. And if you do, true love will come to you. That's why I'm telling you the Wayne Fontana. You're trying not to overuse, it sounds like, the full band stop, even though there are a lot of places where it could happen. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> uh, I never even thought about it until now. I guess that's what it does. <laughs> well, like in the first verse, even though I love this song, it stops. Wayne Fontana was wrong. It stops again. So, but you know, you got two in a row there, but the other times, you know, it's just making it a little more rare as the song goes on, I guess. I didn't write down every single time it happens, but, but it seems. I'd like a count of how many times that happens. <laughs> I want to see how I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it's a natural style for me to work in. And if you listen to pop records, the McCoys or Gene Pitney or Leslie Gore records or more primitive garage rock records, that stuff is just inside me. I've absorbed it to the point where I'm probably recycling, but I don't know it because I don't know even what an original idea versus a borrowed idea is because the stuff is inside me so deep that I'm kind of part of the tradition it becomes idiomatic. It's like blues, that old rock and roll stuff. Unless it's Jeff Beck or somebody who's at, trying to add some sort of psychedelic thing to the blues by taking the guitar to heights that has never been taken before. Blues is blues, and there's not really, originality is not the point. Yeah, and also, like if you uh, saw Muddy Waters and you went up to him afterwards and said, I really like what you did on that turnaround when you went to the five and back to the one, he would look at you and go, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's <laughs> kind of how I am. Not that I'm comparing myself to Muddy Waters by any stretch, but uh, I'm kind of a non-intellectual musician, really. This stuff comes to me really fast. I don't think about it. I just chase it down. That's my job is to chase down these ideas that come to me. And it can come, the ideas can come from anywhere, a conversation or another song I heard that I feel like needs an answer to or something. And Wayne Fontana was wrong, I guess, is an answer song to Game of Love. I like the... Uh repeating myself but Wayne Fontana was wrong. you have a lot of syllables that you know <laughs> sound was this all one take for lead vocal or is this how much are you punching in at all oh yeah oh that's definitely one take I work really fast I make sure I know the song like I sit around with an acoustic guitar and sing it a lot so I know where all the great places are for rhythm I get very comfortable singing it before I get on the microphone that's one thing I do your group answering vocals that's a thing sort of in the traditional 60s garage style. I don't know, pull a, a family member from the kitchen and have them answer you. But no, it's just you do it yourself, double tracked, just to make it a little thicker. Is it just a matter of it's getting someone else in here is too, <laughs> it's an extra step that is not necessary. Well, COVID. Uh, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. but, <laughs> I wasn't going to let anybody, let anybody in. It wasn't vaccinated. And actually it was pre-vaccine. So I had no choice. Uh, this record was recorded completely alone because I was completely alone. You end the song by this call and response thing. It's actually the response first, right? It's the crowd and then you are answering them. He was wrong. 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 He was w
was wrong. He 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 was wrong. So wrong. So wrong. So wrong. And he thought on doing it that way as opposed to the opposite way. Wayne Fontana was wrong. He was wrong. Wayne Fontana was wrong. So wrong. Uh, they repeat me. They repeat you. But then, then when it's ending, it's he was wrong. He was wrong. He yes. Was wrong. So it's the, the <laughs> echo. For, the echo comes first, and the he was wrong. He was wrong. He was wrong. <laughs> Maybe this is not even something you remember. <laughs> Making I, this decision. I, I, you're right. <laughs> Everything that I wanted to put on that song is on there, and it felt like because it was inspired by a mid '60s hit record, it needed to have those classic arrangement touches in it, and it just you know, spoke to me and said, this is what you do. I mean, there's no other way you could do that song, really. So if you were going to play this live, I assume you will at some point, how would you end it? Do you know, do you know how to end it <laughs> or just make it go on a long time? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe a long guitar solo. I don't know. I haven't played it live yet. And I'm thinking, you know, I have to rehearse my band because I'm going to be going over to Spain for a tour with my Philadelphia band, the Quintet. And this record, we're going to need to learn how to perform this album now i'm very curious how that song is gonna work out yeah i guess fill it out with the band because i could hear it just a sudden stop or cheese it up so wrong and you know an amen <laughs> Danny Ma. Yeah, ex exactly yeah <laughs> let's get the second song out there so we've got this is uh i'm sorry but so is brenda lee so it's sort of one of your central songs but not the original version from uh 1992 the vaughn sings vaughn 2007 version well i guess tell me about that whole process you just didn't feel like your old versions were hi-fi enough or what this is more how they sound live why the uh, rethinking here well with uh i'm sorry but so is brenda lee when i wrote it and recorded it i recorded it as a ballad I thought I loved you, I made a promise that I couldn't keep. Yeah, I'm sorry, but so is Brenda Lee. And Marshall Crenshaw decided to crank it up, make it more up-tempo and more powerful, and sing it in a higher key. And I really liked it, you know, and I thought, wow. That's another way to do it. So I re-recorded it later on in a higher key with a full band, which is the version uh, you're going to play. Because mm -hmm. I like the energy of it. It's a victorious song. It's an apology to my ex-wife, actually. But it's a half-hearted apology. You know, <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, but so is Brenda Lee. In other words, I'm moving on. For me, that song, when I wrote that song, it really was cathartic because I was moving on into the future without her. And I was happy for the first time in a long time when I wrote that song. So I felt that Marshall kind of brought that out in the song in a way that I hadn't in the way I was doing it. So I took a page from his book and re-recorded it up-tempo.
just you and your way I guess I went mine And I guess you got your reasons for being unkind But it's okay cause I don't miss the way things So is Brenda Lee Yeah, I'm sorry But so is Brenda Lee Yeah, so making it acoustic, straight, is this just the, in terms of the arrangement here, that's just the band you were playing with? Or is this also you on everything? I didn't actually look that up. Oh, no, no, that's a full band. Yeah. I watched a live version and it seemed pretty similar to this. I guess the live one had an accordion still instead of the organ. Seemed like the only difference. Uh, Is that just the live preference of who you had in the band at the time? Or I guess there's something stage-wise and, you know, old style about the accordion. Any thoughts about which you prefer in which setting? When I uh, formed a Ben Bond combo in 1983, I wanted an accordion player because I wanted to have a portable acoustic rock and roll band. That was the idea. It was acoustic guitar, accordion, an upright bass with a wheel, a caster wheel on the, on the bottom, <laughs> and Lonesome Bob, a very tall guy playing a snare drum on a strap. And we would play on street corners in Philadelphia. That's how we started. And the accordion is the only portable keyboard that I know of. Well, melodica gets too tiring to blow through for that long. Even a half a song is too much for me on the melodica. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. <laughs> so um, Gus Cordovox is my accordion player. So I've been playing with him since 1983. We've been on a long journey together. And the Ben Vaughn Quintet is my band in Philadelphia. We've been together forever. And that's who I tour with when I tour. I only really tour in Europe. My records, I was really lucky when my records first came out, Spain and Italy and France were three countries that went nuts over my music. I was struggling in America to find an audience because they couldn't figure out whether I was alternative rock or whether I was roots rock or whether I was the next Springsteen or the next Jonathan Richmond. Everyone was confused because my humor confused a lot of people in the marketing side of the record business because we had gotten to a point where you couldn't do both. You couldn't be Lieber and Stoller anymore. You're either funny or you weren't. And all of the people at the record labels and managers and publicists, they couldn't figure out what to do with me. But in Europe, they just didn't care. They just loved what I did right away. So the quintet is still together, and we tour over in Europe, and Gus Quarterbox is my accordion player. 40 years, I guess, we've been playing together, probably, at this point. Well, that style of rock that you're most inspired by, as we've said, I mean, has this built-in... I don't know, the line between funny and fun is very thin for me. That if Louie Louie is not a funny song, I'm not sure what it is, you know, even though it's not a parody in some official sense. Louie Louie is an interesting song. We could go on for hours about <laughs> that because it's being sung in a fake uh, Jamaican patois. Is that the word? I guess, yeah. Uh, me see the moon above. I mean, when, you, when you hear the original by Richard Berry and then you hear the Kingsmen totally mangle it into a totally different masterpiece. <laughs> that song is, it's about a guy singing, talking to a bartender named Louie about how he has to go home and see his girl. I mean, it's a brilliant song. Yeah, this has been a little bit of an academic lesson, you know, going back to the Wayne Fontana song. And here, I actually didn't know what Brenda Lee was referring to. That is how disconnected from 50s music I am, having grown up in the 70s and 80s. So looking up this the actual Brenda Lee's I'm Sorry song, which has a different, a 6-8 slow string ballad. Again, you, you're referencing, but you're not stylistically referencing. Well, I wasn't thinking about her song so much. The origin of I'm Sorry But So Is Brenda Lee is I was a landscaper. I never went to college, so when I got out of high school, I went right into the workforce, you know, various physical labor jobs, drove a truck for a while, and I was an offset printer and a paste-up artist, but I was a landscaper for five years. And I was working with this really big guy named Dutch. He was really like mean looking and had no sense of humor as far as I could tell. And I was shoveling mulch one day and I dropped a shovel on his foot and I turned to him and I said, I'm sorry. And he, and he said, yeah, so is Brenda Lee. Okay. And I was like, wow. 
The minute this guy chooses to speak, it's incredibly profound. And the reference, I was just blown away. So I had that title in my head for years. I'm sorry, but so is Brenda Lee. Like, I'm going to use that someday. And then when I got divorced, it gave me a very good reason to use it. So I wasn't really thinking about Brenda Lee's music. I was thinking about Dutch, the landscaper. <laughs> is it a way of just throwing sort of a fuck you into it? I mean, it's... Oh, yeah, it's a half-hearted apology. I'm sorry, but not really. I mean, not really that sorry. I'm mean, like, you know, most of this is your fault, not mine, or whatever I was thinking at the time, you know. Would she get that reference? <laughs> Brad, or does it matter? Doesn't matter. I actually have a, a line in one of my songs. It's a song called Shingling With Me, which is a reference to my ex-wife probably never hearing any of my music. I don't think she's ever heard any of my music, any of the songs I've written. And I can't remember the line, something about she'll turn off the radio every time it comes on. I know she'll never hear the worst of this song because she'll turn her radio off every time it comes on, which is a line I love because I'm assuming I'm going to get airplay. <laughs> <laughs> like the, ego, the egotistical nature of that That's lyric. That's the way you'd hear it, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, well, I'm going to be on the radio and she's going to hear my song. It's like, no, actually. <laughs> Unless she's listened to the college radio in Wichita, Kansas in 1987. No. <laughs> well, that is a weird dynamic with spouses and entertainment products because the personal realm is supposed to be in some way divorced from the, you know, you're not performing. You're, uh, if you're a comedian, your spouse probably does not want you doing bits at them all day, you know, unless it's a very particular kind of code comedian relationship or something. And I know I hit a point where like, I can't write I'm sorry or whatever songs for my wife. Like she very early on, it's like, no, you have to actually talk to me and use, do concrete things and not use a song for something. But, uh, you know, breakup songs are a whole different thing. Those are not, unless you're very mean, actually intended to be received. <laughs> Well, writers are notorious for not being able to show their emotions any other way than through writing, you know. I don't think I'm one of those. I hope I'm not one of those. But it's a longstanding tradition that that's where the expression and the tenderness and generosity and things come out in some artists who are not that way in real life. You know, this seems like a good moment to stop and do our sponsor break. I want to tell you, as often happens, about Masterclass where you learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, at your own pace. You can learn about science and problem solving from Bill Nye, about hostage negotiation with Chris Voss, about floral arrangements with Maurice Harris. Pretty much every kind of creative expression and many other activities are covered here. There are over a dozen music courses, including the new one, Mariah Carey, The Voice as an Instrument. And you might think that Mariah is... Oh, she's just a singer, but no, she is a producer and can tell you how to do that producing, how to communicate with people in a studio, how to arrange background vocals. I especially enjoyed her session on surviving in the music industry, where she kvetches about all the ways that people try to screw you over. Like all these classes, it includes downloadable class resources, which in this case is a very nice PDF that has taken the notes for you on what's going on. And is pretty much just like a nice magazine. The production value in all these courses is high, high, high. So a subscription to Masterclass is like a subscription to your favorite streaming service. Costs about the same. But you can also use it like a podcast. Do the audio only, listen to it at high speed. Jump around between a bunch of different classes. There's always more to discover. There are things for your whole family. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass. As a nakedly examined music listener, you get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash NEM now. That's masterclass.com slash NEM for 15% off masterclass. Well, your style is so low key and casual and a lot of your singing, it's like you could just be talking to me and, but I'm singing instead. I'm doing it with a melody. Is it the instrumental stuff? Like, do you write when you're super depressed or just what is the relationship between your emotions and your output here do you think well the interesting thing is you know escapism is a big part of music for me when i was a kid i would travel through into the radio and up into the sky and pick up radio stations and i was a radio fanatic when i was a kid so the idea that there were up in the ion ionosphere there was music and all i had to do was like tune it properly and it would come through my radio and escapism also I guess, comes into my writing because when I'm going through a bad time and I'm feeling sad or depressed, I write funny songs. And when I'm feeling great, 
I write sad songs. Well, this seems like a great transition to our third selection, Too Sensitive for This World. And this time I want to play the actual, the older version from Dressed in Black. It is the CD of yours that I I happen to own. It has come out on your best of and, you know, you have your re-recorded version. But yeah, I saw that this had John Hyatt and Foster and Lloyd have had Radney Foster on this show. So how could I resist that old version? And a John Hyatt whistle solo. (laughs) Yes. Great whistler. You know, few people know that. John Hyatt is... He should just be a professional whistler. He should have a business card. Professional whistler, John Hyatt. Any thoughts of where you were at in 1990 when this came out? Well, that is the exception. That song there, I wrote that in the 80s when my best friend died, actually. Ah. That's another one of those songs where I had the title for a while. Because it's kind of a provocative title. It sounds like it's going to be funny. You know, too sensitive for this world. It's like a almost like a dare. Oh yeah. Who's too sensitive for this world? It sounds like an exaggerated, you know, overdramatic thing, but I liked the title and I had it in my back pocket. And then my best friend died at age 27 of a heart attack. He had um, a, a heart condition no one knew about. And I was just knocked sideways by that. I mean, it was really hard for me. And that song was written during the fog of grief. And I don't remember writing it actually. I know I did, but that's one of those ones that really wrote itself. Every day starts with a broken heart I must be too sensitive for this world Well, I know it ain't right mm, to cry every night I must be too sensitive for this world And the world is such a callous place It's a wonder survives The clouds in the sky just make me cry I must be too sensitive for this world I don't think I can last until these bad times I must be too sensitive for this world. Sensitive for this 
Yeah, well, okay. If you don't remember writing it, I can. I guess you could talk about how it has persisted then in your live set over these many years. And in fact, you re-recorded it with a similar feel, but moving the verses around and the female vocals instead of the, you know, there, there were various changes. I will refer folks to that if they want to hear it. But yeah, any thought about how, I guess this is a great example of how, you know, something that was created out of grief, but it has, by transferring into this sort of country idiom, I don't know. It it makes it something one can carry through the years. The reaction that song gets from people is incredibly strong. It's really like a powerful song. Like I feel like when I'm when I'm singing that song live, I feel like I'm doing a cover of like an important song because it has that sense to it. And so many times people have come up to me and thanked me for playing it or writing it uh, because it got them through a hard time. It's a very interesting piece of music. I definitely caught something there that's universal on that song. And I don't fully understand all of it because I, like I said, I don't really remember writing and I was in a really, really dark place. And, you know, grief is a very interesting chapter to be in because you really have a hard time remembering who you were during that chapter. When you're finally better, you look back and you go, hmm, I don't remember that. It's almost like we're built to block out painful things. So, that song was written when I was really probably had n- no armor at all. And yeah, it's an interesting song. It's interesting to me when I hear it and when I sing it, I- I'm always struck by, I don't know, it's hard to describe. It's heavy. Well, and it's good that you like it. I recall Bob Dylan talking about Blood on the Tracks. Like, I know that's a lot of people's favorite album, but like, I don't know why you'd want to sit through that kind of pain. Like that he was not a fan of his own at being a spectator of his own past pain. Yeah, and he might have been kidding when he said that, too, because <laughs> he's Bob Dylan, right? <laughs> if you ask him today, he'd probably tell you it's his favorite album, and it makes him laugh, or I don't know, you know, he's Bob Dylan. I remember Joni Mitchell once said, Bob Dylan hasn't done one authentic thing in his life, which got her into a lot of trouble, but it's kind of funny to think about, because he's always kind of performing a Zen trick, like a Dadaist kind of thing. So I never fully believe anything Dylan says, and I enjoy the uh, inauthenticity of it and the playfulness and jokester element of Bob Dylan. I really like that about him. We will never know what he's really thinking. He will never tell us. <laughs> as far as, as you in this song, you know, I had written down next to the line, the clouds in the sky just make me cry. Talk about the humor because it seemed like that rhyme It does not sound like, you know, Alex Chilton at his most mentally or Sid Barrett at their, you know, completely bare souled. No, it is. No, but Roger Miller would have written that line. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Definitely sounds like Roger Miller. Yeah. In a serious song, like Husbands and Wives or uh, One and Burying and One and Dying. One and Dying and One and Burying. I'm a huge Roger Miller fan and he's a huge influence on me because he was able, I mean, King of the Road is a masterpiece, a man of means by no means. Just that line alone, it's unbelievable what he was capable of doing. And he was funny 
and serious. John Prine as well. John Prine would have written that line. It's country writing, really, or folk. The clouds in the sky just make me cry. It's not funny to me, but I could see where the simplicity of it might be perceived as funny. But again, go back to Roger Miller and you'll find the same exact dynamic. I know They Might Be Giants have said, like, don't even ask us whether this is, you know, this is not Weird Al Yankovic. It's just trying to put a label on it. Is this supposed to be funny or not? Is beside the point, right? It is expressive. It is doing whatever the function of art is supposed to do. And, you know, that's one of the great things about it is you don't kind of have to sort of to revise my point about this thin line between fun and funny is that fun can then become, if I do a cover of a soul tune, you know, it's usually because I'm sort of doing it in a naughty way, in a, in a somewhat ironic way. But I don't, I, I want to make fun of those guys. Like, I enjoy it. And then when I listen to actual soul artists, and they're doing that with grit. They're doing it with their entire soul. And I think there's, you know, something similar going on with what you're talking about with country, that they're in a figure like Roger Miller, that it can be humor that is gallows humor or, you know, just something that is like, let's not put a label on it. Don't say, ask if this is light and funny or if this is dark and serious. It can be both. Yeah, Tom T. Hall, another one. And Chris Christopherson, even just, I put on my cleanest, dirty shirt. I had a beer for breakfast and another for dessert. That's funny, except it's Sunday morning coming down. Hello, the guy, the guy is in bad shape. But there are lines in there that make you laugh. To me, it's natural. I gravitate towards writers like that. Uh, Chekhov is my favorite writer for that reason, you know, or Maupassant. Writers like that, there is humor in tragic stories, details, even like Stephen Crane, Red Badge of Courage. There are some laugh out loud lines in that book. I don't see why that shouldn't be allowed. And the record business is not the best place to try that stuff. You know, by the time I came around, Randy Newman's another writer. He'll have a funny line in, in a very sad song. That's the tradition I follow. And it was hard for me because I'm also a real rock and roll guy. I really like to play rock and roll, very primitive rock and roll. So I was combining the John Prine kind of Tom T. Hall thing with Paul Revere and the Raiders. And that's why everybody got confused. You know, <laughs> it felt natural for me to go in that direction, but I could see why marketing people would scratch their head and go, okay, pick one or the other. I think the one area where it is widely understood, this ambiguity between humor and seriousness is in things having to do with alcohol, right? So if you're the Pogues or something, that is, you can do what serious rock and roll does, this Dionysian whatever, but also be funny because like that's just built into being a drunk, that you're pathetic, but yet, you know, it's a laugh. You don't sound drunk on your songs, so you, you can't tap into that popular perception. No, no, I'm usually <laughs> sober. Yeah, <laughs> usually. <laughs> you know, we're going quickly enough here. Let's throw in, in this extra alternate tune to give you an excuse to talk about the Cubist Blues album. We can throw in Candyman. The most popular one is Fat City, just because that's the opening track. But that's eight minutes, eight and a half minutes long. I don't want to yeah. <laughs> descend into that. It's not a prog rock thing, this particular episode. Alan Vega, Alex Chilton, and you, and I had gotten it because I was an Alex Chilton fan. Do you remember, can you say a little about this project and this track? This is a crazy one-night matchup here. In 1980, Alan Vega put out a record called Jukebox Baby, and it completely changed my view of what I can do with music because it was modern rockabilly, and it wasn't revivalist like the Stray Cats or anything. It was modern rockabilly, and it was one chord, no chord changes. It was just this repetitive groove with him singing like Elvis with slapback echo and a great, great record. And that gave me permission to follow my path, which a lot of it is modern rockabilly, you know, modern ideas with using rockabilly or garage rock as a bed for new ideas, but not being revivalist. A big influence on me. And when I met Alex Chilton, I met him, uh, we had the same booking agent and we were put on a tour together in 1987. And the first night of the tour, we had met before, but it was a long time before that. But we, you know, we remembered meeting each other, but we got to know each other on that tour because we were together every night. And we would play guitars in the dressing room and back at the hotel and all that kind of stuff and became good friends. And one of the first things we talked about was how much we both loved Jukebox Baby by Alan Vega. He was completely in love with that record, as was I. And that was kind of a basis for our musical sharing, Alex and I, our appreciation of music. It was the first thing we really connected on and realized that we were attracted to a lot of the same things musically. 
I met Alan Vega in the early 80s, and I gave him a cassette of my songs. It was before I had the Ben Vaughn combo and before I had a record deal. I met him at the Ritz in New York City, and he gave me his address and told me to send my music to him because I told him I, you know, I was a big fan and that I, I play music. So I sent him a cassette, and he called me on the phone and told me how much he liked it, and he w- told me he was going to play it for Rick Ocasek and try to get Rick Ocasek to produce me, <laughs> which did not happen. So Alan, I knew Alan... And I knew Alex separately. And in 1994, Alan and I decided to make a record together, a blues album. Because I always saw him as a blues singer, even though he was in Suicide, which is an, you know, an electronic duo and a lot of the stuff he's done is considered uh, industrial music or whatever. Someone once called him the uh, grandfather of industrial music and his reaction was, I demand a blood test. <laughs> but I mentioned to Alex on the phone, I, He asked me what I was up to, and I said, well, I'm going to be recording with Alan Vega. We're going to make a record together. Just the two of us, I might have some other musicians. And Alex said, can I I play on it? I said, yeah, except there's no budget, so I can't fly you up from New Orleans. And he said, "I'll I'll pay my own way. So he paid his own way, and we got together in a studio. I, we gathered up some instruments. We borrowed some stuff from people in New York City, like a synthesizer, a, a Roland uh, bass synthesizer, and uh, a couple guitars and amps and things. Went into the studio for two nights and just improvised that whole album. And sort of, I guess, decided after the fact what counts as a song? Alan sang live. It's all cut live. And then we would do one or two overdubs because there was only, you know, two musicians, and Alan, Alan only sang. He didn't play an instrument. So I would be on drums, and Alex would be on guitar. And Alan was singing, and I would, me or Alex would lay down a bass or maybe a pan, piano part, and then we move on to the next song. It completely improvised. Alan improvised all of those lyrics, which is really a gift. We were astounded by his ability to just keep churning out lyrics while we were playing. But the whole thing was, it's like a jazz record, you know, where you like a, one of those records where you have Coleman Hawkins and you have Ben Webster and and I don't know who else on piano and bass and drums, and they get into a room and they play. And it's recorded, and then everybody leaves. <laughs> That's, it was recorded in two nights. I mixed it the third day. I went in and mixed the whole thing with Alex. Alan didn't want to be anywhere near it. It was already over for him. He's one of the most immediate people. He is in the moment and only in the moment. And when we were getting ready to cut that record, I asked him, so what do you want to do? And he goes, we're not allowed to talk about it. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, no expectations, man. No expectations. When they push the record button, we'll find out what we're doing then. And I'd never worked that way before, and I was really blown away by that. I wasn't comfortable with it at first, but I understood the minute we started recording that Alan is ready. He's really, really ready. And Alex and I responded to that. It was so much fun to do. Mr. 
Candyman is fine too. So much love here on tough city streets. Garbage truck flies by, killing my son. Hey, what you got, baby? But what you got for me, baby? Hey, come on, Mr. Candyman. So did that give you a taste for playing in a group? I mean, was there even some point, it sounds like there was not even a point in early in your career where like you were working with another songwriter or otherwise, you know, having to be in a more collaborative environment that you've always been the guy. Is that right? No, I've been in bands where I was just a musician. And I started out as a drummer. So I, I have experience not being the guy. <laughs> Although they would let me come out and sing one song when I was a kid, I would sing Wine, Wine, Wine by the Nightcaps. You get a nickel, I'll get a dime. We'll go out and buy some wine, drinking wine, 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 which, you know, high school kids go nuts over because it's about underage drinking. <laughs> you know, the perfect song to sing. I have experience on both sides, you know, and so also as a record producer, I've experienced not being the artist, you know, I, I've produced records, so. Yeah, can you say a little about sort of how you're combining those different facets at this point to cobble together a living of recording solo and producing and doing, still doing TV work, I assume? No, no, I quit TV about, when that 70s show went off the air, I decided to retire from that world. I had done it for 11 years. A lot of money came in and I couldn't think of anything to spend it on because I, you know, I've been poor my whole life. So when the money came in, I didn't even, I didn't really relate to it. So I just kind of socked it away and I kept buying my shirts at thrift stores, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't all just go into better and better vintage equipment in your studio. <laughs> I did build out a studio in Venice because at one point I was doing three TV shows at the same time. I was really hot for a while there, you know. Everything I, I worked on was legitimate mainstream success. It was an interesting period, the Hollywood period for me. I did well and I couldn't think of anything to spend the money on. So I'm still living off what came in during that time. I have a very modest lifestyle. And during that time, were you still putting out? I haven't done the chronology. <laughs> were you still putting out albums or touring at all, or, or pretty much the TV took up your time? Uh, it took up my time. I did a few things. Uh, Cubist Blues and um, Rambler 65 were recorded before I moved to LA. So they were already in the can. I had those in the can. And I think I only, during that time that I was doing TV, I think I only recorded release one record that came out in Scotland that I recorded in Scotland with the Teenage Fan, fan Club guys and the Bell and Sebastian guys cut a record over there that only came out over there. But I was really too busy to do anything else. Yeah, I was just today watching the Rambler 65 video, which is on YouTube. And maybe that's a good way to sort of like explain your humor <laughs> is just show them something with some other elements beside the music like that. 
that has, okay, oh, oh, this is what you're about. All right, that's your sort of tone. Well, Rambler 65, the origin of that, I was in a recording studio, a very expensive one in New York City, and we were trying to record, we we're recording a conga player, which ought to be easy, but the way the room sounded, the congas did not sound good, so we started putting baffling up, you know, to make them sound better, and we were hanging blankets and everything, and you know, just as a joke, I said, I could get a better sound on those congas than my Rambler, which is right outside. Should we try that? And everybody laughed, you know. And then I started thinking about it, like, wow, I wonder. So I told a friend about it, and he, I said, you know, I, I bet you I could record an album in my car. And he said, well, now you have to prove it. Now that you told me, you have to prove it. And it conveniently coincided with my midlife crisis. So I had a project. You know, some guys buy motorcycles, some guys ditch their wife and get a 18 year old girlfriend. I moved my recording studio into my car in the driveway <laughs> and recorded an album and it came out really good, but that wasn't released for about two years. Rhino Records heard about it and then wanted to hear it. And the minute I played it for them, they were like, this is perfect for Rhino. And we shot that film, the making of Rambler 65, a video came out with it. Was it actually recorded just with a single SM58 on pretty much everything? Any electric guitar you hear on there, I use the trunk as a, an isolation booth for my Fender Deluxe reverb. I ran the mic cord through the, um, the tail light. I unscrewed the tail light, and there's a hole there for the light bulb, and I took the light bulb out and I ran a, a cable through there <laughs> and closed the lid. I could sing and play guitar at the same time with no bleed through. Well, and it's good to see some example... I know I've been in periods where like, oh, I kind of want to record stuff, but I just need to get a little better gear to make. No, just do it. You can do it with one SM58 and your four track or whatever. And better to do than not to do. Yeah. Make sure the song is, is good before you do it. And then it kind of doesn't matter what you use. I've never, I've always been very irreverent, I guess would be the word about gear. I don't even know anything about gear. You know, a lot of times people come up and go, they start telling me about a, a rare guitar they have or an amplifier or some kind of adaptation they did on their amp by putting in some capacitor that's supposed to be better than the original. And I, my eyes glaze over because I have no knowledge of any of that stuff. And when I'm working in a real studio, I just tell the, the uh, engineer, just do whatever you do. And if it doesn't sound good to me, I'll let you know. <laughs> and that's it. I don't really think about it or know much about it because for me, it's about the song. Am I serving the song? And that's more about arranging and, and what parts you're going to play to complement that message. You know, it's about communication for me. And getting bogged down in uh, technical talk or being a gear fanatic is not even an impulse that I have. It's inconvenient because I share a little that way that I don't remember brands of gear or whatever when I'm talking with my musician friends. But then also want to be a one-man, you know, self-engineering band. There's a certain advantage that the the engineer friends of mine, for instance, who, who also do that, have over someone like me that doesn't have any native interest in that, of wanting to spend a lot of time on which mic is best. It's really good to be friends with people who know about that stuff, for sure. Well, I guess now you just do a, a web search anyway. Where do I put the mic in front of the kick drum? <laughs> yeah, there's some tutorial by some guy probably with a British accent. Well, I like it three inches away from the kick drum and then one slightly above, but off 90, you know, 90 degree angle over the ride cymbal. Nice. This is one of these discussions I have of, do you put two mics on a snare because you want to have a separate mic just for the bottom of the snare? I do, actually. I always do that. So you see, you get the crack of it because you're getting the hit on the top and the rattle of the actual snare, which is stretched across the bottom head. You want that. All right. Well, I had never actually settled on which way I liked, but it was one of those things. Now, I don't always use it, but I always record it. If I feel like the snare doesn't have enough sizzle to it, I start bringing up that fader until it does. And that's, that's what that's for. Yeah, I guess there's enough tech that just if you have to EQ stuff yourself, it's not that hard. You just figure, <laughs> you just listen to it and do it. It doesn't mean that I know offhand then which decibels I just boosted. I just, uh, you know, where in the frequency range, you just do it with the knobs. It's fine. Let's wrap up here to uh, Dancing In My Mind, your latest single, which is not actually on the album. It came out already. Let's just introduce this and we'll be on our way. What do you have to say about this? There's a cool COVID style video of this. I will refer folks to. <laughs> yes. Well, that's Lockdown. That's a song about lockdown, Dancing In My Mind. Um, I got the idea in the early days of, of the lockdown, I drove into downtown LA on a Friday night. I was just driving around. I wanted to see what the city looked like 
during lockdown. And it was really weird. It was really spooky because the dance clubs, where there's usually a line to get in, were dark. They were closed. And I imagined, this is another song that came to me while I was driving. A lot of my songs come to me while I'm either driving or when I'm walking. I don't really write songs with a guitar in my hand. Mm -hmm. They come into my head first, and then I have to figure out later what the chords are. (laughs) And this is another one that was like that. I was imagining the clubbers who usually go out every night and dance to techno and all that, you know, and take ecstasy and the whole the whole scene, you know, which is huge, you know, raves with DJs and everything. I was imagining those people at home in their apartments alone on a Friday night, and I imagined them hooking up a disco ball and dancing at home alone or in their minds, so to speak. And it was a very strong image and very of that time. And as I was driving home, I I got the idea for the song. And then when I started recording it, I started playing that organ line. And I realized, oh, this is going in a a more of an 80s direction immediately. It needed to have that kind of, that 80s feel, that joyous, mindless. There was a song in the 80s. I don't don't know if you remember this one, but it it always cracked me up. The Politics of Dancing. Reflex, I think. And it's like, um, the politics of dancing. Yeah. The politics... And then it goes, the politics of, oh, feeling good. And I was like, well, that is so great that like feeling good is as as political as you're going to (laughs) get. I love it. You know, I always love that song, even though it's really ridiculous. And so dancing in my mind is kind of in that tradition. All right. Well, fun song. Very fun catalog. Thanks so much for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you. This has been fun.
Thanks so much to Ben. A wonderful interview, despite his being, according to his own estimation, ignorant of the sources of his songwriting, but certainly knows a lot of rock history and otherwise a great talker. Go to benvon.org to learn more, not only about his tunes, but about his radio show, which there is a podcast version of. If you want to look up the many moods of Ben Vaughn, hosted by Ben Vaughn. My next interview for this show will be with Mark Stewart. He was the lead singer of a band called The Pop Group in the late 70s that has since reformed. Does a lot of dance electronic music as a solo artist and now collaborator. His new album, Verses, has collaborations with Mike Watt, with Stephen Malander from Cabaret Voltaire, with Front 242, Lee Scratch Perry, and many others. To make sure you get that promptly, make sure you're subscribed to the Nakedly Examined Music specific feed. You can find the various links to do that at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. I would love while you are there on the Nakedly Examined Music Apple Music page, say, that you would leave a nice rating and review for the podcast. And if you really like the podcast, you should support it. Go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic. Or if you're using Apple Music, there's a subscribe button that will upgrade you to be a subscriber to the Mark Lintertainment channel, which gets you ad-free versions and some bonus stuff for three of my podcasts. But whether or not you want to do all that, thank you so much for listening. Without your support and encouragement, I certainly wouldn't still be doing this. You can always reach out to me at mark at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com to suggest guests, to suggest yourself as a guest, or just share your thoughts. And I hope that you will keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Vincent Meyer signing off.